There's one more set of theories about language acquisition that we should look at, and these are sociocultural theories. These have really been developed in the last 40 years or so, since the 1980s. There are a couple of things that are immediately obvious about language use, and that is that it doesn't just occur in the brain of one child. It occurs in speech communities. And so as far as um, acquisition goes, uh, a sociocultural theory is that languages is Languages are learned from cultural and social interaction. Back when we were looking at some of that children's language, um, Gaga, for example, the fact is that adults hearing that don't just stop and stare blankly at children. They make an effort to understand what's going on. And so language acquisition is a two-way street. If you watch the rest of that TED Talk by Deb Roy, there's a fascinating section that talks about how adults, without even knowing they're doing it, will simplify their language and uh, scaffold their language um, by using gestures, by using um, uh, realia, basically, actually showing a cup and the tap and so forth, um, in order to, to scaffold language acquisition. And it's not an extraneous set of behaviors. It's actually part of language acquisition for the child. Um, people, when we're learning a language, we internalize it. Um, uh, according to the context that we learn it in. So if you're uh, going back to the Gaga water video again, you'll hear that there's a few of those samples where you can hear a bath running and a tap running and so forth. Uh, a couple of other very important sociocultural theories are that language itself is the basis for cognitive development. This is a very uh, Piaget in um, view of, of uh, cognitive development, that language is in fact a, a structure in, um, or uh, sorry, not a structure, but an, an impetus for, for cognitive development. Um, and um, we might have time to talk about Lev Vygotsky's work, but in Vygotsky's work, um, which is, can be applied to language acquisition uh, studies, um, we learn from more uh, competent peers, whether those peers are, are literally our peers or whether they are um, caregivers and so forth. And so cognitive development itself depends on language and it also depends on social interaction. And the same thing could definitely be said about speaking and writing. These are processes in which we, uh, our minds develop and grow. So looking at um, second language second language acquisition now, uh, the first point of departure is to say, is it the same as, as first language acquisition? So is L1 the same as L2? Well, the answer is yes, it is. It's very similar. The answer is also no, it isn't. It's completely different. So the real answer is, of course, yes and no. There are lots of ways in which first language acquisition and second language acquisition are similar. So let's have a look at some of those ways. Some of the things that are the same that are the same are adults need interaction and communication. Yes, of course, you can sit down with your Mongolian grammar book and uh, a Mongolian newspaper, and after several years, you'll be able to translate Mongolian, but you won't be able to go into a bar in Ulaanbaatar and order a cup of coffee. You need to do that through interaction and communication. Adults learn very slowly. Well, that's the same as L1. Now, Chomsky says, children can learn their language incredibly rapidly and says by five or six years most children have a, a complete understanding of the grammar of the language. Well that's not strictly true. If you go into the folder second language acquisition on Blackboard there's an article by Eva Dubrovska um, who, who uh, has written quite a bit about um, cr critiquing Chomsky and linguistics and um, she basically takes down that whole argument about how quick it is. And if you think about this yourself, when was the last time you learned a word in English? Well, it was probably fairly recently. I learned a word last week just by reading a book and it came, came across some words that I'd never seen before and that happens frequently, so I'm always learning my language. But even if you're just talking about the basic grammar, it takes us about 18 years to learn our first language. So when we look at adults learning um, language and we say they're so slow compared to children, that's not really true. Adults make a lot of errors while they're learning and we often try to tell adults 
it's important to, to make errors because that's how you test out your hypotheses. And adults also go through stages of acquisition, just like children do. So um, there's been a lot of work on adults learning um, a second language and looking at an order of acquisition. And that this is quite controversial um, because it, depending on the language, the first language of the adult, this order of acquisition might be changed. And depending on the context in which they learn a language, and again, this is just talking about English here, um, this, the order might be changed. One famous um, second language acquisition theorist, Stephen Krashen, um, put together a set of theories, and one of those theories is that there is a fixed order of acquisition, and that's not really accepted um, these days. Um, can children really learn a language better than adults? Well, not really. Um, in terms of pronunciation, yes, because um, as we said right at the beginning, there's uh, very early in our lives we have a mechanism that helps us to learn just the sound palette of the language that we're in. And so, of course, if we're still in that window, which is actually ab about up to six years, maybe up to puberty in some cases, um, the jury is still out. But uh, certainly before we become adults, we're better at learning accent than after. But in terms of how quickly we can learn and how um, the resources that we can use to bring to language acquisition, adults um, in some ways are much better than children at doing this. And I would just ask you to think of this. If you had, if I gave you today 18 years to learn Chinese, do you think you would be able to learn it? Well, of course you would, and you probably wouldn't take 18 years. So, would you learn it as well as a Chinese speaker? You might if you were in a Chinese speaking community. So this idea that children are much better language learners um, is wrong for several reasons. First of all, if an adult said something like, I can't put it in, a teacher could say, put it in. Now the adult's going to know, the adult learner is going to know that that's a correction because we don't randomly go around repeating things that other people have just said to us. So in the context of classroom language acquisition, the adult would be able to recognize that it's a correction and say, put it in. So correction does work and adults can learn from correction. And there's a lot of research now that says correcting works. But a student has to notice the correction. So it's unlikely, but if the adult said, I can't put it in, and the teacher said, put it in, it is possible that the adult would say, no, I can't put it in, <laughs> just like the child did in the earlier video. But it's less likely than with a child, because adults have a more sophisticated understanding of interaction than children do. So what are some of the advantages? Well, adults don't have to go through a babbling time. They can organize their information. These are metacognitive strategies that they can use. In other words, they can study. And adults are interested in learning from correction, not just about uh, the, the, the pragmatic import of what they're saying, what they're trying to achieve, but actually the linguistic import as well. What are some of the advantages of children? Well, most of the time they're surrounded by him. Uh, by input. They're not afraid of making mistakes at all, so they don't get embarrassed when when they say the wrong word. They just keep saying it. They're always trying and always practicing um, whatever Chomsky says, and they play with the language a lot. They, they have fun with it. They mess around with it. They get creative with it, um, and they say all kinds of uh, extraordinary things. And it's possible that if they, uh, if adults can do this as well, can be as playful and creative and so on, they can learn very, very fast. But what if you're not really like that? So personality really comes in um, because if we've, if as we've said, you have to make mistakes to learn a language, what happens to adults who don't like to make mistakes and want to be, and this is many, many of us. We don't like to look foolish by saying the wrong thing because it makes us feel like children. So if you can learn from your mistakes and you make a lot of mistakes, then you're going to learn faster. That's the basic equation of that. Um, and if you're not afraid to make mistakes, then um, you, you'll be, you'll learn faster. But if you are, then you'll learn more slowly. So one of the things that we have to do is to create an environment where uh, 
adults, especially or older learners, let's say, um, are not afraid to, to uh, try to use the language and are not afraid to try and make mistakes. So that means creating an environment that is um, very accepting and um, relaxing for the adult. So clearly in this view, personality is going to have an effect on your ability to learn a second language. And by personality, what are we talking about? Well, openness, talkativeness, being tolerant to risk, being tolerant of ambiguity, uh, not being embarrassed, being curious, being outgoing, and being unafraid. So if we think those are the kinds of um, personality traits that are going to uh, enable you to get the most out of an interactive uh, speech environment in terms of being able to learn. Well, okay, fine, but what if that's not you? What can we do about this? We can compensate as adult learners with a sophisticated um, uh, learning mechanism um, and uh, lo a lot of hear a history of learning things, we can compensate. So, for example, we can be systematic, we can be hardworking, we can be observant, and we can train our learners to be observant. We can be willing to learn, and we can read. Reading is huge because that generates a lot of input very, very quickly. Uh, we can be curious, and we can be diligent, which I think means the same as hardworking. And we can be persistent, we can keep trying and not get frustrated. So, what do teachers need to know? Well, I think based on all of these things, there are three essential elements and there are three very helpful elements in learning a second language. And in class, we're going to explore what these are.